The battles across occupied Europe were some of the most vicious battles of World War II. They were also some of the most unusual. Town by town, city by city, soldiers fighting through Nazi Europe found themselves dropping their guns for unexpected parades. They were, after all, the liberators. Battle-weary, they received a rare reward to witness the joy of a people liberated, liberated after years of oppressive Nazi occupation. The programs you are about to see pick up the progress of World War II from a point several weeks after D-Day. These unusual episodes trace the movement of the Allies from the invasion beaches of southern France through the battles of the Low Countries to the borders of Nazi Germany. These programs contain the unusual images of street fighting, as well as the bitter struggles through mountain passes and dense forests. Produced at the end of World War II, these official documentaries convey a sense of time and place that modern documentaries simply cannot recreate. We present these programs without any editorial intervention whatsoever. First, though, some still photography from occupied Europe. into a huge open-air marshalling area. This vast quantity of mechanized war implements was to be used by the 3rd, 36th, and 45th Divisions, which later were combined to create the 7th Army. All equipment was loaded aboard, and each piece was checked off the loading chart. The men put in charge represented the best Allied military brains. Fresh from their recent victories, the new 7th Army, all seasoned veterans with experience from the Sicilian, Salerno, and Anzio campaigns, marched to the embarkation port. Friendly Red Cross workers gave a warm touch to the send-off. With precision, reflecting the efficient planning of this campaign, the men marched on board in a steady stream. Their faces showed every human emotion. A few of them would soon see action for the first time. 
but most were veterans of the tough fighting in Africa and Italy. Bulging with their cargoes of men and machines of war, the ships left the harbor to join the convoy being formed offshore. This fleet, assembled off the west coast of Corsica, was made ready for the fight ahead. On board one of the cruisers, General Patch, Vice Admiral Hewitt, and Secretary of the Navy Lemonnier of the French Naval Commission met for a conference. Clustered on the decks of the ships, men attended to last-minute details. Many prayed. A few held aloof, alone with their thoughts. On the night of August 14th, the first special service force was put ashore on the beaches of Port Cross and Levant to destroy enemy defenses on both islands. Simultaneously, French commandos landed north of these islands. Heavy bombers attacked vital enemy installations. Dawn was breaking when the huge armada of fighting ships slipped into the assault area without opposition. Each vessel took up her allotted position. Navigators, gunners, and signalmen were alert. Every man had a job to do. The Germans must be routed from their stronghold. Every gun was made ready. The fight was about to begin. Huge Allied bombers winged their way toward Toulon. En route to their objective, no opposition was encountered. For 30 miles from Cannes to Toulon, our air armada patrolled the seas, protecting the Allied convoy. They continued to attack north of the Cavalier area. Throughout the entire operation, Anti-aircraft fire was negligible, and the Luftwaffe was absent. The 509th Parachute Infantry Battalion was inspected at Falonika Airport. These men were chosen for their intelligence, their strength, their ability, and drive. They had been through a tough course of training, taught the art of killing, the art of survival in a strange land, and the quickest way of getting from any given place to another. Hundreds of C-47s and C-54s swept across the southern coast of France. Below could be seen other paratroopers who had spearheaded the invasion the night before. The air was full of parachutes drifting slowly to the ground, carrying hardened American veterans to reinforce the men who had preceded them. Further inland, the gliders were nosing downward onto the soil of southern France. These landings were made close to Lemuy in the hilly country. Many of the gliders didn't have an easy landing. Paratroopers advanced stealthily, following the course which had been given them. This aerial vanguard was to destroy the enemy defenses and ease the task of their comrades still at sea by keeping the foe from rushing troops to the coast. Swooping down to treetop level are attack planes, straight Nazi gun batteries, troops and supply trains with telling effect. In the calm of a summer morning, these bombers rained destruction, while the Allied warships were steaming along the French coast within range of enemy batteries. As the dark of the night melted into dawn, the faint outline of other ships could be detected. Tense and alert, the men waited at their battle stations. H hour. Guns of the fleet opened up and the invasion of southern France began. Landing craft bearing men, tanks and ammunition raced toward their objectives. American PT boats vanguarded the invasion. Transports released their cargoes. Some assault boats were lowered empty into the sea. Others were fully loaded. As these landing craft headed for the shore, there could be no turning back. The roar of the fighting planes, the booming of the big guns, and the rockets zooming overhead created a never-to-be-forgotten inferno. A group of landing craft escorted by destroyers and patrol boats 
moved toward another beach sector. Troops began to scramble up the beach. They were prepared for an enemy onslaught. But not a single German soldier appeared. Not even a Luftwaffe soared overhead. Under Lieutenant General Alexander M. Patch were three corps. The 6th Corps, commanded by Major General Lucien K. Truscott, included the famed 3rd, 36th, and 45th Infantry Divisions. The French 2nd Corps was commanded by General Jean de Latre de Tassigny. And the 1st French Corps was under command of General Bethois. Still unmolested, men and supplies were landed. However, rear guard sniping caused small delays at some of the landings. 100-foot floating causeways were dropped into the waters. Mine detector squads cleared the roads to permit our tanks to continue on their way. German prisoners were herded onto the beaches for removal to ships. By midnight of August 16th, the French commandos had been contacted. Operations had progressed so smoothly that by noon the following day, a beachhead 20 miles long and 9 miles deep had been established. Our seriously wounded men were evacuated to floating ambulances. Meanwhile, the enemy fought desperately to block our advance in order to cover a general withdrawal. On the 19th of August, the French 2nd Corps took over the southern zone from the American 6th Corps and, bypassing Toulon, pushed rapidly on to within two miles of Marseille by noon of the 20th. The wounded were given life-saving blood plasma and first aid. Prisoners taken in the advance were immediately evacuated from the combat zone. General Patch, accompanied by General de Tassigny, who now commanded the French B Army, awarded the Silver Star to Marc Rhino, the leader of the French Patriots in this area. The 3rd Division, en route to Brignol, halted its drive momentarily. In these rare moments of relaxation, the men found relief from the rapid pace of their drive. Brignol was liberated by the 15th Regiment of the 3rd Division. The Germans had not yet offered any strong opposition to our rapid advance, which moved forward according to plan. A first aid station was established to give immediate medical attention to the more seriously wounded before they were evacuated to hospitals. The 3rd Division continued its advance toward the west. Throughout the early stages of the campaign, Lemuy remained an important communications and road center. At Calais, a few miles northeast of Dreginon, partisans rounded up French civilians who had been spying for the Germans, a scene which was repeated in each liberated town. The flushing out of these traitors made the advance into the interior safer. On August 21st, Monoc was liberated. Our advance elements had difficulty in keeping contact with the retreating Nazis. This town did not become a battleground, and the rapid movement of our forces prevented any German destruction. When the first part of the 3rd Division entered Avignon, they had a close-up of the destruction caused by our bombing. The streets were deserted, for the civilians did not believe the Germans had actually left. Only the FFI, having seized the town center, waited for the arrival of our troops. The French force entered Marseille. Isolated Germans, cut off from further retreat or aid, had to be liquidated. In other sections of the second largest city of France, parts of the 3rd Algerian Division guarded against possible counterattack by Germans left in the city. The streets remained deserted until the patrols routed out the last of the enemy. Fort St. Nicholas was one of the last centers of resistance. Atrocities similar to these were perpetrated on civilians by the Nazis until their final expulsion. Street defenses in the heart of Marseille had been prepared by the enemy in their plan to hold the city. 
However, they left these emplacements shortly after they were attacked and retreated to the more easily defended forts. For this reason, parts of the city were spared heavy destruction. But in the harbor area, the Nazis had systematically destroyed dry docks, warehouses, and other port facilities. At the Marino airport, our pre-invasion bombing had destroyed the hangars and damaged many aircraft. These planes, originally French, had been remarked by the Nazis for their own use. The liberated population of Marseille cheered the triumphant Algerian troops. General de Josselard de Martisaberti, commander of the French Algerian division, was congratulated by General de Tassigny and by Monsieur de Til, French Minister of War. Here, too, the enemy was forced to leave its street defenses. In the months before the invasion, Allied air bombing had rendered the naval base useless as such. But the Nazis continued to utilize naval rifles and other undamaged weapons which had not been destroyed. With other wrecked warships were those the French had scuttled. This is what remained of the famous French fighting vessel, Dunkirk. This submarine and torpedo plant, although damaged severely, had remained in use until the capture of the port. Fort de Jana, built by the French in 1936 and taken over by the Germans in 1940, had been rendered useless by Allied bombing. Among the weapons the French had installed were 320 millimeter guns, which with their turrets, had been taken from battleships. At Fort de Cis Four, the Germans surrendered only after their water supply had been exhausted. Before their surrender, they destroyed many heavy guns. In Toulon, joyous people cheered the French troops. In this amphitheater of hills behind Toulon, the French had constructed a series of strong forts which guarded them against invasion from the sea. It was into these strongholds that the Nazis now retreated for their last defense of southern France. The French forces, commanded by General de Tassigny, pushed westward to check the Germans moving up the Rhone Valley. Meanwhile, segments of the American Sixth Corps composed of the 3rd, 45th, and 36th Divisions, advanced westward and northward. Roads were littered with destroyed enemy vehicles, guns, and Nazis. Town after town was left behind by our troops in their rapid advance to catch up with the retreating enemy. entered Grenoble, 140 airline miles from the beaches, and Motelemar on the Rhone River, about 100 miles from the coast. Both places were reached only eight days after landing. Up to this time, prisoners of war numbered about 17,000. These included Czechs, Poles, and Russians, many of whom had been forced into the German army. When our troops passed through the towns, they found that abandoned vehicles and equipment had already been appropriated by the FFI. Partisans were rounding up Nazi sympathizers, including French women, who had been friendly to the Germans. Our only interest in these proceedings was to examine the suspects for spies and saboteurs. On the afternoon of August 29th, the 2nd Battalion of the 7th Infantry Regiment of the 3rd Division caught up with the enemy five miles north of Montlemar. With the destruction of this second segment, we had captured nearly 15,000 more troops, which had been concentrated to block our advance. To prevent our rapid thrust up the Rhone Valley, the Germans concentrated heavy forces below Montlemar. But Task Force Butler, composed of elements from the 6th Corps, skillfully wheeled through Die to the Rhone, pocketing the Nazis from the rear. This was in conjunction with our units of the 3rd Division, which were driving up from the south. Our artillery went into action. No 
trapped by our rapid maneuver, the Germans fought savagely. The Nazis who escaped annihilation fled northward, pursued by our Air Force and units of the 3rd Division. In their haste, the Germans left much of their valuable equipment intact. Task Force Butler really paid off. who had been cut off from their escaping comrades were rounded up and imprisoned. While the 3rd Division was moving toward Lyon, the 191st Tank Destroyer Battalion, in support of the 45th, raced northward above Lyon to cut off the Germans who were retreating through the Rhone Valley. After four long years of Nazi slavery, the freed population staged a wild celebration to welcome our men. The major delaying tactics of the retreating enemy consisted primarily in destroying all bridges, railroads, and blocking highways. There was no rest for the engineers. Major General John W. O'Daniel, commander of the 3rd, crossed the bypass to direct the pursuit. On September 11, 1944, reconnaissance elements of the 1st French Armored Division entered Dijon. Dijon is an important road junction on the main highway leading from southern France. The few American civilians in town on this date were given very special attention. Meanwhile, at Sombernon, 13 miles west of Dijon, French troops attached to the 7th Army joined with the French units of the 3rd Army. The final line had been forged between our forces, which landed in southern France on August 15th, and those which had landed in Normandy on the 6th of June. This junction closed the last escape route for the Germans remaining in the south and west of France. Thus, the fighting qualities of the soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the United Nations defeated the enemy in southern France. Their valor, stamina, and devotion to duty were beyond praise. Fighter planes strafe ground targets. Shelling the Riviera coast. Taking part in this operation were United States, British, and French vessels, as well as ships of the Netherlands, Poland, Greece, and Belgium. Landings begin at 0800 hours, supported by covering fire from battleships, cruisers, and destroyers. Three divisions, accompanied by French troops, made the original assault the 3rd, 36th, and 45th. Company 141st Infantry, 35th Division, meet heavy opposition as they hit the beach east of San Rafael.
advancing inland against slight opposition. Back at the beaches, reinforcements and equipment are ready to be landed. an abandoned, incompleted German pillbox. A camouflaged Nazi gun emplacement. One of our landing craft hit by a radio-controlled flying bomb from a German Dornier. Most of the personnel escaped. Landing heavy equipment as the original beachhead expands east and west. Engineers construct an airstrip through a vineyard. The runway will be 150 by 3,000 feet. D plus one, the invaders held a coastal strip 40 miles long, 20 miles deep. Normandy towns rapidly returned to normalcy. At Bayeux, the Civil Affairs Committee has arranged for the return of radio sets to the townspeople. The radios were confiscated by the Nazis four years ago. During that period, the only contact these Frenchmen had with the outside world was through the underground. As these natives of a typical small French town enjoy the restoration of legal rights and possessions, elsewhere the battle continues to extend the breakthrough at the base of the Cotentin Peninsula. American forces resting in Pont du Beau, 3rd August. The breakthrough in the Cotentin Peninsula provided a corridor for the movement of troops and supplies, not only for drives into the Breton Peninsula, but also for the advance toward Paris. Troops occupy St. James, widening the narrow corridor leading into Brittany.
Wren, capital and communication center of Brittany, falls to General George S. Patton's forces, 4th August. American paratroopers captured by the Nazis on D-Day freed after two months imprisonment. Liberation ceremonies conducted by the mayor of Rennes. French patriots round up collaborationists. German ordnance depot just outside the city of Rennes. The speed of the Allied advance forced retreating Nazis to abandon substantial quantities of equipment. Advancing toward Chérance le Roussel, in spite of Nazi attempts to close the narrow corridor at the base of the Cotentin Peninsula and stop the movement of Allied forces into Brittany. Another American armored column, after driving southeastward from pont a reaches the outskirts of Mayenne, rail and road junction leading toward Paris. Entering Mayenne, 6th August. Troops moving eastward along a 40-mile front enter the highway junction of Laval, 148 miles from Paris. battling rear guard Nazis across the river that cuts Laval in two. Rounding up more collaborationists.
enemy film allegedly depicting a Nazi counterattack east of Saint Lo as infantry of the U.S. First Army endeavors to break through stubborn German defenses 17th and 18th July. Nazi tanks move up. disabled Sherman tank. Films by German combat cameraman of an allied plane attack on the San Lo airfield. Five shot down by heavy anti-aircraft fire. Paratroopers and grenadiers of the Waffen SS. <laughs> British equipment supposedly wrecked in the Saint Lo area. Actually, there were no British ground forces engaged in the Saint Lo area. This scene has been arbitrarily included in the subject by German film editors. Yank prisoners. Zambra Island in the harbor of Saint Malo, where resisting Nazis blocked Allied use of Saint Malo's port, first of Brittany's harbors isolated after the breakthrough from Normandy. Nazis repeatedly ignored requests to surrender. One of the last of these requests is made at 10.30 hours, 18th August. Delivering the message by Cub Plane. Refusing to surrender, the Nazi garrison is once more attacked, this time from a hill near Dinar, where Americans used captured Nazi self-propelled 155-millimeter howitzers. 
Capitulation came only after a siege of more than three weeks. General Patton's Third Army, sweeping across Brittany in multiple drives, advances toward Nantes, major port near the mouth of the Loire River. Entering Nantes, 10th August, after slight opposition. Troops continue to cut up enemy dispositions at the base of the Breton Peninsula, threatening units of the German 7th Army along the Loire River. Farther along the Loire, another American column advances toward Angers. Angers, occupied 10th August, celebrates its liberation by removing vestiges of Nazi occupation. Maquis recruits are instructed in the use of firearms. These are the patriots of the French underground movement, men who resisted Nazi domination for four years. Battling rear guard Nazis. Units of the 3rd Army consolidate the line along the Loire and press on east toward Orleans. American forces near Orleans attack elements of the German 7th Army at one of the largest airdromes in France, built by the Luftwaffe. The airport had been subjected to heavy aerial bombardment by Allied aircraft. Ties salvaging inner spring mattresses from the airdrome's administration building. A 2,000-pound German bomb, one of many placed at intervals on the airfield to prevent the landing of Allied planes. August, an American armored column striking from the base of the Brittany Peninsula advances toward the important rail center of Le Mans. Infantry occupy the city of Le Mans 10th August after covering 55 miles in 36 hours. French civilians loot a German warehouse at the railroad yard in Le Mans. Supplies reach Le Mans from Cherbourg, a distance of 170 rail miles. French civilians and members of the Free French Army Work Battalion aid in sending supplies to the front lines. From Le Mans, Allied troops swing north in an effort to encircle the German 7th Army. French patriots demonstrate how they maintained contact with Allied forces by means of an improvised radio. Despite a German headquarters next door, news of Allied activities was received from D-Day until the time of liberation. Power was generated by an old motor and a bicycle. On 12th August, an armored column enters Alençon, narrowing the German escape route. Allied forces advance north to the town of Sepp, steadily compressing the pocket holding 80,000 of General von Kluger's desperate 7th Army. Brigadier General Jacques-Philippe Leclerc arrives at a forward echelon to consult with members of his staff. A French manned American tank that received a direct hit from a German 88mm gun. Shelling Argentin. Through the city passes the main lateral road along which the whole German left and center would expect to retire. Direct hit on a German ammo truck. (laughs) 
entering Argentin at 1200 hours, 20th August. Meanwhile, British forces strike south from Caen, just west of Saint-Sylvain on the Falaise front of the Argentin Falaise pocket, a Canadian armored division closes in on the German escape route. On the Vier Mortain front at the extreme western end of the Falaise Argentin pocket, artillery units of the American First Army repel strong enemy attempts to break through our positions to the sea and cut supply lines of the Third Army. Entering Gatemo, north of Mortain, 11th August. Armored vehicles advance on Mortain after throwing back another enemy counterattack, one of the most decisive actions of the campaign. Mortain, after changing hands several times, is occupied 13th August. French patriots volunteer for service. American forces narrow the German escape route in the Argentin sector, entering La Ferte Massé, 14th August. Spanish workers in a German labor battalion at Carouge, which fell 13th August. British troops advancing towards Saint Lambert sur Dive as they seek to effect a junction with American forces. prisoners. German officers at Saint Lambert sur Dive surrender as the escape gap begins to close. Nazis rounded up by French forces of the interior. The Falaise Argentine pocket closes 19th August as U.S. troops advancing northward from east of Argentin affect a juncture with Canadian and Polish units moving down from Trun. preparing to fire a request to surrender to remnants of the trapped German 7th Army. Offering the enemy food and water, the message warns Nazis they are surrounded by a ring of steel. <laughs> Captured German Lieutenant General Otto Elfelt and two of his staff at Nona La Pinte. 10,000 Nazis caught in the Falaise Argentine pocket are imprisoned in a concentration camp formerly used by the Germans. General Eisenhower confers with Under Secretary of War Robert P. Patterson and Lieutenant General Brown Somerville in the Cherbourg Peninsula.
British Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden. General Charles de Gaulle and General Eisenhower. French patriots take up arms for a march toward Paris. From a hay-lofted shark 45 miles outside the capital, they remove long hidden weapons. French forces of the interior pile up difficulties for the Germans over the entire area bordering on Paris. Their job is to remove Nazi strong points, clearing the way for Allied columns. Demolition fires set by the Germans within the city. The center of Paris is quiet. A French cameraman photographed these scenes before the first uprisings of 18th August. FFI headquarters. 50,000 adequately armed Maquis soldiers await the signal to rise from hideouts in the Montparnasse and Montmartre sectors. At this command post, a command post within Nazi-held Paris, the FFI maps its strategy. Street barricades are erected for the impending battle with the German occupation forces. The street fighting begins. German troops in Paris number 10,000. The cross of Lorraine identifies a French tank participating in the fighting. A few de Gaullist patrols have filtered into the city. Patriot fires at a German street fighter. The fatally wounded Nazi soldier is quickly disarmed. German elements attempt to flee the city. The FFI takes hundreds of prisoners, but still faces strong opposition. Allied armor speeds toward Paris six days after the outbreak of hostilities within the city. Vehicles are halted while Frenchmen remove roadblocks set up by the retreating enemy. Crowds greet the French 2nd Armored Division, which enters the city on the morning of 25th August, led by General Leclerc. They arrived, accompanied by American units on orders from General Bradley, to clean up the remaining Germans inside Paris. First patrols of the 2nd Division had entered Paris the night before to occupy German headquarters at Hotel de Ville and the police prefecture.
approaching the Eiffel Tower. Street fighting flares up at frequent intervals. Civilians rush for shelter as American tanks return fire of another German point of resistance. Shelling the Ecole Militaire, where German snipers are still entrenched. Nazis who held out within the Institute of Germany, formerly the Polish Legation. Prisoners sweep the streets in front of German headquarters at the Hotel Majestic. French and American troops ride past Paris landmarks. Notre Dame Cathedral. <laughs> Through the Place de la Concorde toward the Champs Elysees and the Arc de Triomphe. More collaborationists are rounded up. are hissed and manhandled by the excited crowds. At 1700 hours, Friday, 25th August, Lieutenant General von Schortitz, commander of the Paris region, had officially surrendered the German garrison. Nazis entered Paris 14th June 1940. Today, it is the first continental capital of a full-fledged ally to be freed from Nazi domination. The first U.S. flag in Paris. Armored elements of the British Second Army advance on Thielberg, pivotal city of the German retreat from the southern Netherlands. The advance slows down at a Nazi demolished bridge spanning the Wilhelmina Canal. Crossing the canal via the twisted girders. No. 
After clearing the area of snipers, the rest of the battalion crosses the canal in assault boats. A bridgehead is secured and shortly thereafter the former Nazi stronghold is neutralized. On the western flank of the Netherlands front, the Anglo-Canadian offensive to open Antwerp is expedited by amphibious operations. First of these is the crossing of the Skelt estuary from the mainland. Objective to contact the 2nd Canadian Division fighting along a peninsula toward the islands in the estuary. Alligators reach the southeastern coast of Zuit Bevelant, garrisoned by 2,500 Nazis. Later, other armored vehicles arrive, pushing westward to the causeway linking Zuit Bevelant with the farthest of the Skelt group, Walcheren Island. Waterlogged Walcheren Island, last German strong point commanding the approaches to the important port of Antwerp. Half of the island is underwater as a result of RAF bombing of the sea walls. But five small areas garrisoned by some 7,000 fanatical Nazis pose a problem whose solution is finally found in a large-scale seaborne attack. On 1st November, a British armada of 200 ships bears down on Walcheren's western shore. counter battery fire. Preparing for the landing at West Capella, site of the main Nazi coastal batteries commanding the entrance to the Skelt estuary. A foothold is secured, but at great cost in ships and men. Artillery on the mainland paves the way for another landing on Walcheren. British commandos prepare to embark. Objective, Flushing, Holland's third port on the southern side of Walcheren. Meanwhile, several small craft set out to lay a smoke screen for the amphibious operation. Nazi coastal guns from flushing fire on the smoke-laying craft. British Army commandos land at 0945 hours, meeting less opposition than Marine commandos in the West Capella assault. Fighting ceases after fierce house-to-house -house action ending the last phase of the battle for the port of Antwerp. Prelude to the Battle of the Reich. Captured with 2,500 Germans, Lieutenant General Willem Dazer insisted on waiting until dawn for a formal surrender. Outnumbered 10 to 1, the small company of British captors agreed to the erratic commander's whim. On 17th August, explosions destroy large stores of ammunition at a former Nazi ammo dump in the harbor area of Cherbourg, causing a number of deaths.
stockers of ammunition were affected. Among the items stored by the Germans in this area were unexploded American 500-pound bombs dropped by our aircraft during the siege of Cherbourg. A demonstration of the crocodile flamethrower used with the Churchill tank at bretville sur odon 25th August. Special fuel is carried in an armored trailer. A geyser of fire can be thrown for more than 450 feet. Technique and control have been developed to the point where flame spray can be ricocheted to produce fire in distant pillboxes and trenches. The fuel carrying trailer is devised to be controlled from the tank and moved in any direction. If necessary, it can be jettisoned so that the tank may operate normally. In use as Allied armies advance through France, the Churchill crocodile has been designed as an emergency weapon to burn out enemy strong points. At the Seine, 30 miles west of Paris, the first American-built bridge is constructed across the river. The span is of the steel treadway type supported by pneumatic ponton floats. A treadway bridge company assembles the approach section for the 512-foot bridge. Engineers report the job was completed in record time. On 24th August, exactly four minutes after the last pin was driven, the first armor rolls across to the north bank of the Seine. The German capitulation in Paris. General Leclerc is present as the Nazi garrison is officially surrendered by its commander, Lieutenant General Dietrich von Schultz. Collaborationists are rounded up along with the German occupation forces. At the Arc de Triomphe, huge crowds of Parisians see General Charles de Gaulle honor the unknown French soldier. General de Gaulle leads a procession down the Champs-Élysées to the Place de la Concorde. His tour of the capital after it was freed included a stopover at the Cathedral of Notre Dame. 40,000 as the general entered. Snipers suddenly opened fire and the crowd scattered for cover.
snipers were active in various parts of the city, firing from windows and rooftops into heavy crowd concentrations. to shield captured pro-Nazis as they are pushed through throngs of aroused civilians. General Dwight D. Eisenhower visits Paris. The Supreme Commander's party includes Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder, Deputy Supreme Commander, Lieutenant General Omar N. Bradley, and Lieutenant General Joseph Pierre Koenig, military governor of Paris. The first parade of American troops in the newly liberated capital of France. 